All right, I think we might kick it off. Um, so my name is Oliver Maruda. I'm one of the co-founders of the Whiskey List. So thank you for everyone joining tonight and supporting us with this virtual tasting. I've got um, Andrew and David Baker from Bakery Hill tonight joining us uh, to chat about um, Victorian whiskey, uh, which is, um, you know, I think super current with everything that's going on with uh, COVID and, and, and everyone under lockdown in Victoria. But these guys have been um, working through and through. Um, Couple, couple fun facts um, about them. So they're the oldest uh, single malt whiskey distillery on the mainland of Australia. So I think uh, 98, um, they started thinking about it, registered the business. First whiskey was poured into barrels around the year 2000. So uh, 20 years um, that the guys have been uh, making whiskey uh, down here in Melbourne. So um, yeah, please welcome uh, David and Andrew. In terms of the, the chat, um, I'll just keep everyone muted, otherwise the background noise gets a little bit busy. But um, if there's any questions throughout, just put it into the text. Uh, I'll jump in and we'll, um, yeah, we'll answer those qu uh, questions on, on your behalf. Um, and then yeah, if there's any sort of follow-up or anything like that, um, if you need to pop out or something like that, we've, um, we're recording the session as well. So it'll be available on the Whiskey List app on YouTube, Facebook, uh, et cetera, all the socials. So you need to jump out and catch up a little bit later. Uh, in terms of um, yeah, buying the whiskey, any whiskey that you like afterwards, um, we'll, we'll send out a, a follow-out email with um, links and all that sort of stuff as well afterwards but uh yeah if there's no other questions and if that all makes sense um yeah please i'll, I'll welcome um both david and andrew uh, baker from bakery hill distillery welcome guys thank you for joining us thank you very much thanks Ollie. Um, i'd just like like to welcome everybody tonight and it's great to see everyone sitting back relaxing um with nights like tonight there's nothing worse than uh, sitting there saying geez i'm dying for a for a good single malt and you sit there for about half an hour and you're still looking at it. So I thought the best thing might be to kick off with the first one. This is one of the original uh, expressions that we made. It's the Bakery Hill Classic. It's unpeated. It's matured in American oak bourbon casks, heavily charred. And because our conditions and because it's in the uh, heav heavily charred barrels, we mature our whiskies for generally six, seven or eight years. So if you're warming up your whisky, the one thing I'd like you to experience as we go, and I'll get Andrew to go through the tasting of this particular whisky, um, is the sweet caramel nuttiness of it. But while you're sitting there enjoying the nose and having a quiet sip, I'd just like to let you into a, the little secret on how the hell somebody in Melbourne could be making whiskey. When we were told, the world was told, the only place in the world that can make whiskey is Scotland because of the air and the water. And if you haven't got the air and you haven't got the water, you can't do it. Well, I started off my life as a chemistry teacher. So if you want to know where the meth bus is, it's buses, it's out the backs. We're not, we're not talking about meth tonight. We're talking about single malt whiskey. Um, I was basically a, an organic chemistry teacher and I got to a point in my life when I started looking towards the future saying, what am I going to do when I retire, if that ever happens, apart from sitting on a rocking chair on the veranda? And the answer was, no, look for something else to do just to keep your mind and yourself physically and mentally active. After reading all these articles about for coming out of Scotland saying that you can't make it anywhere else because of the air and the water, I was determined to prove that wrong. Because we do make some of the best wines in the world. We do make some of the best beers. Why can't we make some of the best single malt whiskies? So 20 years ago, I started experimenting and getting into this. I'd never drunk whiskey before I started. It was purely a chemistry experiment. Well, I've been doing that for 20 years and it's the best thing I've ever done. Andrew's on board now. He came on board many, many years ago. And uh, it's a great family business. We can, we can keep chatting on. Do you think it might be time, Andrew, if you talk about the classic? Yeah, well, I think um, the only thing I can really add to that is now this, the reason we're starting with this whiskey, um, the sort of the... Um, the subject of the um, tasting tonight is sort of Bakery Hill past, present and future. And this, this whiskey is really the whiskey that dad got into the business to make. Uh, he had a real passion for a space side style whiskies. 
Um, so we're up there in the in the north uh, east of Scotland. So uh, massive whiskey producing area. You've got you know Macallan, Glenlivet, Glenfarclas, Glenfiddich. Um, so those sort of sweet, fresh, um, long, complex finish. Um, they're the kind of whiskies that Dad really um, really loved. So, so therefore, that's what we decided. To, he decided to make 20 years ago. So from the you know from the ch choice of the yeast to the design of the still to the barrel maturation, everything is pointing in the direction of this particular style of whiskey. So um, great place to start because this whiskey, the DNA from the classic really runs through the entire Bakery Hill range. So you're gonna get that sort of sweetness, that nougat, honeycomb, vanilla, fresh apples, fresh pears, those sort of flavor profiles coming through all of the other whiskies that you're gonna try, even our peated whiskies. Um, so classic whiskey, um, it's really the flat, a flagship, so it's a really great place to start tonight. Now, while you're having a little uh, nose and a, and a taste of your classic, Andrew mentioned the still. Now, there are a number of places in the whiskey manufacture that we can make a real difference to the flavour and the profile of our whiskies. The yeast is extremely important. The next would be the cut points in the distillation, and the third would be the actual design of the still. Now, there are some places dotted around the good old country of Australia that their whiskies are very, very similar. Now, the reason for that is that the stills have been manufactured by the same company. So if the still's the same, the wash, that is the, the unhopped beer that they're using is manufactured by the same company, the whiskey will be very, very similar. So I decided at this stage to go to a still engineering company in the UK and get them to design a still for me. I had no idea what was going on. So I actually contacted a company in the UK and the first thing that the manager said to me was, you need to tell us exactly what you want your whiskey to be like because everything in the design of the still is going to affect the whiskey flavor, aroma, and quality. Unless we know the style that you want, we can't do it. So we had a long discussion about what I enjoyed. And as Andrew mentioned, it was the Speyside sweet, nutty, nougat, honey characteristics, and very, very aromatic. So we had many discussions about the style of whiskey, and they said, right, we think we understand what you want. And they then designed and built stills for us. Now, we should have two stills, They've been both drawn up, but at the moment we just run 1,000 litres still. We just don't have the room for a second still. When we relocate, and more on that later, uh, we'll have room for a larger wash still. But the still is really, really important. So, um, if David, I, I might just jump in. So, I normally would ask at a tasting, a physical tasting, as everyone uh, understands how whiskey is made, um, but I can't do it obviously with hands up in, in a virtual room. So for those are completely new to whiskey, it's three simple ingredients. It's barley, you uh, grind it up, you chuck it in with some fresh water, beautiful water. Every water is massively important to making whiskey. You know, all the Scottish ads say they're, they're waterfalls and lakes and, and you know, deep bores and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the, you know, you guys have your own water source as well, which is great. Could be, uh, I think it's Victorian tap water from memory. Uh, we, no, no, no. We have Chateau Sylvan here. There you go. <laughs> uh, for those people north of the border, it's the Sylvan Reservoir. Sylvan, but then, but, but I call yeah. it Chateau Sylvan to give it a bit of edge. Uh, beautiful water there. But uh, yeah, you uh, grind up your, your barley, uh, put it in water, throw in some yeast. Uh, you let it ferment, which is what we're talking about, this, uh, this beer that's unhopped. Uh, you then distill it twice. Uh, the, the distillation twice is important. Uh, you basically then take um, that distill it. Um, I'm keeping it super, super basic, by the way, for those in the room going, oh, you could add more technicalities. But you take that new make spirit, we call it, uh, put it in a barrel. Uh, unlike Scotland, uh, which is the, the legal limits, three years uh, minimum to age to be called whiskey. In Australia, it's only two years. So a lot of distilleries will launch a, a whiskey after two years. But uh, Bakery Hill... Uh, matures uh, predominantly in uh, ex-bourbon casks from the States. And for about five to eight years is your usual sort of um, uh, age uh, turnaround from memory, guys, if uh, jump in. Yes. Oh, that, that, that's whiskey making. Uh, yeah, you, make, you make it sound so simple, Oliver. Anyone could do it, eh? <laughs> uh, but 
Well, we, I hope that maybe we last, but, we can make it even simpler. The very best, the most expensive single malt whiskey in the world is nothing more, nothing less than double distilled beer. Yeah, it is, it is, it is relatively simple to make, but uh, it's, it's the time um, uh, that you've got to devote to it. You know, when Dad started producing his whiskies in 1999 and didn't get anything out until 2003, 2004, then you've got to hope it's something that somebody actually wants to buy. Um, the other um, really, really tricky thing is consistency. Um, we, you know, we absolutely follow, um, we've got a, a book of procedures when we're brewing, when we're distilling. So any, any of you guys can come to the distillery and as long as you follow those procedures, you're going to basically make what we want you to make. Um, we uh, have a, or dad's got a reputation for being uh, Mr. Consistency as well as um, Mr. Breaking Bad in the, um, in the whiskey business. But um, that, that's the thing that we really pride ourselves on is that, that you try our whiskies today and you try that same whiskey in uh, next year, you're going to be equally pleased. We don't have good batches, bad batches. Um, we also should, you know, important note is that all of our whiskies are single barrel expressions. So a couple of points here is that single barrel allows us to get the entire flavor profile from that barrel. So when you blend barrels, like most large distilleries do, you're getting an average of those barrels that you're blending. So you're gonna lose certain elements of the flavor, the tops and the tails. When we're talking about single barrels, we're getting the full flavor experience. So being able to do that, and then also being able to do it consistently uh, it's something we're really proud of uh, and we can do that because we don't rush any of the barrels each barrel we have takes its own sweet time to mature the whiskey to where we, we're happy with it so some may take five years some may take six 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 and a half seven um, that's why we don't put on the label how old the whiskey is because it's it's somewhere in that range depending on whichever barrel that we've got it from but each barrel will get to the point we want it to you know, different times that it can take. Yeah, can, I, can I jump in there just for the, the, the new beginners here? Um, yes, we could put seven years on our label. That's seven years maturation in Melbourne. Now, whiskies do not mature at temperatures below seven degrees C. Scotland has two climates, cold and bloody cold. And they have quite a few days that the temperatures are below seven degrees C. So they need to mature their whiskies for 10, 12, 13, 15 years. In Sydney, particularly in Melbourne, our ambient temperatures are much, much higher. Also, the temperatures fluctuate from night to day. And this causes two things. One, the high ambient temperatures cause our whiskies to mature at twice the rate that they do in Scotland. So our seven year whiskey, say the one that you're drinking now, is equivalent to a 14 year old scotch on flavour because of the higher temperatures. The second thing is that the temperatures fluctuate night to day and it causes our barrels to breathe. Even though they're wood, they still breathe. And at night when it cools down, they suck in. During the day when it warms up, they breathe out. And this breathing causes a lot more interaction in the barrel. So we're getting our whiskies at twice the rate of Scotland. Thanks, Andrew. Hey guys, um, I think we might, um, just in the conscious of our time, let's kick into whiskey number two, um, the, the Bakery Hill Peated Malt. Um, whilst we've um, got a question from Mick uh, from the audience, which he asks, uh, how many barrels on a particular product do you run? What, what do you mean by how many barrels do we run? How many different styles of whiskey? Um, I'm just repeating verbatim what, uh, what's been published in chat. Mick, if you want to... I think it might be, I think it might be around, you know, do we have, you know, how many barrels of classic do we have? How many barrels of peated do we have? How many barrels? These sort of, th that might be where, where okay. um, Mick is coming from. Um, so we probably, in, in essence, um, our two whiskey uh, can be broken down into unpeated and peated whiskies. Um, the double wood is another whiskey which is made from unpeated spirit. But um, if we've got about 200 barrels, we'd probably have about 100 uh, unpeated or classic barrels, probably um, 70 peated barrels, and then the other 20 or 30 would be uh, experimental or different, different style um, uh, product barrels. I hope that answers that question. 
And whilst we're, I guess, we're, we're talking on the, the subject of peat um, and we're, we're about to drink uh, whiskey number two, what, what is peat in, in the whiskey making process? Well, I, might, I, might jump, I might jump into this one. Uh, when we talk about peat, we actually talk about two quite different um, materials. Uh, today in industry, if we need to, to do any heating or uh, we tend to use uh, LP gas, we use solar, we use electricity, things like that. But if we go back 200 years in Scotland, in their industry, particularly their whisky making, they didn't have these fancy heat sources. They only had a local raw material called peat. And peat is basically brown coal. It's brown coal made out of decomposing vegetable matter. Now, I mentioned that there are two styles of peat. And this, we'll talk about that in a moment when I also talk about the whiskey that you've got in your glass now. The main peat, which you've probably tried, is a, is a coastal peat, an island peat. And this is decomposing seaweed. Now, with decomposing seaweed, it also forms a brown coal, but the whiskey that you get is going to be very medicinal, it's going to be very salty, it's going to be quite, quite sharp. So like a, like a Lagerville and Laphroaig, I beg, those kind of flavours? Yeah. Yep. Now, the, the, the other type of peat or decomposing uh, a veg, uh, or brown coal is highland peat. And this is decomposing vegetable matters, trees, leaves, things like that. The, the whiskey that uses that would be typically an Oban. Now, when I started, um, I decided the peat whiskey that I was making, I wanted it to be enjoyable. Now at that stage, Ardbeg, Lafroig and Kalila, they're great whiskies, but for a newcomer to whiskey world, they're quite sharp and they're quite, they're hard to drink. So I deliberately chose to go along the path of a Highland whiskey. So when you try your whiskey, and Andrew will take you through it, our whiskey uses Highland peat. So it doesn't have the medicinal, salty characters that you get with the Ardbeg or the Freud. Do you want to kick off, Andrew, with this I think you've pretty much nailed it. Um, <laughs> now we can go further. All right. Um, well, um, our peated whiskey. So it's produced exactly the same way as the classic whiskey, that you've, the first one you've had, except the only difference is we've got the grain um, peated. Um, from the maltsters. Um, so how we brew it, how we distill it, how we um, age it, still aged in American oak ex-bourbon barrels for between six and eight years. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 it's a peated whiskey for people who are potentially um, getting into whiskies uh, or who want a, a peated whiskey where they can also taste and enjoy the, the other um, sweeter and other complex flavour elements of the whiskey rather than just being dominated by that peat, peat palette. Um, the, the other, you know, an interesting, an interesting point to note in your glass, it's a quite a light colour. Um, so it's, it, it's not that sort of dark colour, but one, one, one thing to note is ne never judge your whiskies by the colour of it. Um, colour really doesn't mean much at all. Some of those biggest, boldest Isla whiskies Kalila, Ardbeg, Lafroig, they're quite light. They're very straw coloured. Um, and they, there you go. Thanks, John. Um, they really, really pack a punch. And that's why they so, put it in a green bottle. So you're not put off by the colour. Uh, I could just quickly put something in there. A lot of distilleries actually add caramel to their whiskey to, to increase the colour. So just because it looks good doesn't mean it's a natural colour. Um, I got into trouble up in Canberra, because the very first batch that we did, here it is, here it is, folks. This is the very first batch that, and that's the label, that's the one, that's the label we chose. Nice colour, isn't it? But that's caramel. Now, I sent some of my samples up to Jim Murray. He, he, I knew he was going to be the keynote speaker for the night, for the, the series. So I sent some of our whiskey over to uh, Jim Murray over in the UK. And he said, yeah, they're great. And then I met him up in Canberra and he tried some of this one. And he said, David, what have you done to that? It is shocking. And I said, Jim, the only thing I've done is I've added some caramel. He said, yes, I know. Never ever add caramel to whiskey. It destroys the flavor. And from that moment, we've never ever ever 
added caramel to whiskey. And we tell people like tonight, don't let the colour influence your, your feelings for the whiskey because caramel does the opposite. The other thing about that, we bottled it at 40%. Now, Jim, Jim said, well, why did you bottle at 40? And the answer was, well, everyone else does. He said, no, each distillery will have its signature strength that will work for it. You go away and try different strengths and you'll find out. And he was right. At 40%, you had to hunt the nose and hunt the palate. It just wasn't there. But at 46%, which you're drinking now, it just erupts out of the glass. So from that moment, we always bottled now at 46%. That's, even if it costs us more. Well, that's, that's awesome to hear. We've got a couple of questions coming in. The first one, um, what's the PPM in uh, the, the parts per million, the, the smoke right. amount? Right. Norm smoke? Normally, you're looking around 40 parts per million, uh, phenols and cresols but we work on 20 parts per million. All right, that's great. And um, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, Ulex uh, asks, oh, his first comment is saying the sovereign smoke was amazing. So congrats guys. <laughs> Fortunately, not, not on the tasting tonight, but uh, he asks, uh, what was the difference between normal peated and the sovereign smoke? Yeah, is it just that... Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Ulex. Um, yeah, the sovereign smoke sold out. So if you've got any of that left, uh, well done. We might want to buy it back off you at some point. Uh, two. Jeez, lucky. What else have you got stuck at home there? Um, so the sovereign smoke was actually um, a more coastal uh, style peat, and it was actually from a Belgian maltsters. Um, so Belgium, um, obviously, a lot of coastal areas there. So um, the, uh, the flavour components of the Sovereign Smoke was more of your Lafroy, Kalila, Ardbeg, um, and it was more in the range of the 40 to 45 parts per million. So a uh, bit more bit more peated, and you're going to get a bit more of the sea, seaweed, a bit more medicinal on the nose and on the palate, whereas the peated that you guys have just enjoyed is the more of that Highland-style peat, which is a bit more earthier, doesn't have the um, that the, the sea, seaweedy or medicinal um, flavor profile the the first thing that i notice I, I love my peated whiskies i like all whiskies but um as winter comes the, the the colder it gets the more peated whiskies i drink like octomores go crazy for them but um <laughs> this this bakery hill peated malt the, the second whiskey we're trying it's it's incredibly sweet on the palate mm -hmm. the, the smoke is a, a very sweety smoke it's not like your isla malts um to, to me that's really gentle and easy drinking i quite like it so um yeah well done guys for that but um I want to keep this tasting going because um yeah an hour goes by so quickly. Let's uh, crack into um whiskey number three, which is all about the present. So that was a little bit of an introduction about the past. Uh, David and Andrew got into whiskey. You know, former school teacher, chemistry teacher Walter White. Uh, you know, he's doing the good type of chemistry now, no, no longer teaching the kids, but teaching us about um whiskey making now. But um, as as we pour whiskey number three, the the Bakery Hill, the Blunderbuss, uh, this is a, a a collab. So um, one of you lovely gents want to jump in and tell us about um, what what does that mean? Who did you collaborate with, and and, and tell us the story behind the Blunderbuss? Yeah, I might um talk through that one. So this has been a few years in the making. Actually, we've had a bit of a um, ongoing relationship with a brewery here in Mel Melbourne called Hop Nation. Um, and they do um, amazing craft beers um, and really experiment with a lot of hops, hence the, the name Hop Nation. So they do each year uh, in winter a Russian Imperial Stout, uh, which they call the Kalash. Um, and they have used um, American oak. You've got the can there, have you? Indeed. There it There's is. There's the can. That's the Kalash. And they use uh, bourbon, ex-bourbon barrels to mature that Kalash. Uh, a couple of years ago, they approached us and um, wanted to do a, a run um, on tap only at a few venues, which was the Kalash matured in Bakery Hill uh, whiskey barrels. So, yep, we flung a few barrels their way and the, the whiskey and the, the beer came out and it was sensational. And we said, we've got to do that again. Um, so this year, um, we actually got some more ba barrels over to um, Hop Nation and they produced a large volume. And there's the can, the Kalash this year, um, which as you can see, it's turned into a bit more of a gold miner. Um, do you, you can hold up both cans, Dad. The first one was more of a Russian soldier. The second can is more of a digger from the gold mining period of Victoria. Um, there we go. Um, so, and the difference is that, 
the Kalash on the left is matured in a Bakery Hill barrel. So they canned that this year as available around the country. It was at a massive 13.4% uh, alcohol or four standard drinks in the one can. So not quite a six pack on a Friday night kind of beer. But the other thing that we did in, in tying it in with that particular beer was we got a couple of the barrels back from Hop Nation, which had had Russian Imperial Stout in it. And we finished off uh, our classic unpeated whiskey in those Imperial Stout barrels. So what you've got in your glass there is a whiskey which has probably spent about five years or so, five to six years, um, as the classic, so as the first whiskey you had in American Oak ex bourbon barrels. We then transferred it into 50 litre barrels returned from Hop Nation, which had had Russian Imperial Stout in it. Um, and it was a bit of a risk, you know, you're not quite sure how these things are going to turn out. But this one, really in particular, if you warm it up and nose it, and if you keep coming back and keep nosing this, it keeps changing. And I, it was really amazing, just the different flavour profile that we started getting from that sort of breadcrumbs and sweet and savoury. And I was just getting something different every time. At some point I was getting, you know, little bits of sort of, you know, dark chocolate, and then I'd get salted popcorn, and then I'd get Guinness, and then I'd get, you know, all sorts of things. So um, we're really, really um, happy with how this one came out. Um, only a few boxes of this one still available. So it was, we only had sort of 250 to 300 bottles that we got out of it. Um, and um, there's only, only a few left, but um, yeah, we really uh, be interested in um, any, of your, any of the thoughts or, or questions you guys might have on the blunderbuss. Yeah, send, send for your comments in the chat. Um, John, John makes a comment saying, I'm so glad you showed me the difference in the cans. I was actually thinking the same thing. I thought there was just one beer can out there. I didn't know there were two. And, and, and now yep. um, Ulex asks, where can you get the beer from? Well, that's, um, that's the bad news. It's sold out. The beer is completely sold out? It is. I tried to get some about a month ago. It was sold out in two weeks. Yeah. It uh, just I think hopefully they do it again next year. Oh, please, please, well, um, please. Uh, so, something I need to note. So the first two whiskies we had were bottled at 46% uh, percent ABV. This one is at 52, so a lot more stronger ABV. So if it's um, punching you in the face because of that alcohol, um, typically we, we kind of recommend everyone takes a tiny sip on your palate, swirl it around your mouth, get your mouth used to the alcohol content. That second sip you go for, the third sip, um, you actually taste a lot of the other flavor notes um, and that alcoholic burn won't be there. Otherwise, add a couple of drops of water in, just like two or three tiny little drops. Don't, don't pour your whole water in and that can lower the ABV and some of the more gentle, fruitier flavor notes can kind of you know, rise to the surface as well. You don't have to drink whiskey straight at 52%. Um, yeah, it's, it's all personal preference at the end of the day. What do you guys think of this one? I've, I've, I, I love cast strength whiskey and, then, and, and a stout finished uh, barrel is um, those chocolate notes like Guinness. Um, that, that's kind of what I'm getting front and center. Even I'm getting like chocolate orange sort of on the nose as well. A bit of citrus. Yeah, yeah. So you can see on the label of the bottle there, um, there's uh, that that's it's a similar character to the um doesn't work so well on my screen your 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 bottle looks better there dad but um it's uh, it's a tie it's a tie in with the can mini bottle yep. here too show, show the can show the can alongside the uh, bottle they, they were really um these these were meant to be also enjoyed as a ball maker um if you were lucky to get in in two weeks and get the get the can um but um Yep, so um, they, go, they absolutely work so well together as well. So, um, but also if you just have um, any brown ale or a stout, um, if you're looking to match a beer with a whiskey, that's what I'd be recommending with this particular whiskey. I'm so glad you mentioned Boilermakers. There's, um, it's not like uh, American Boilermakers where they chuck the whiskey shot into the, the beer glass. <laughs> don't, 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 don't do that. Or you can if you really want to. Uh, but we, we're, we're simply talking about pouring a glass of beer. Um, yep. There's no right way to do it. You can try a bit of the beer first and try a bit of the whiskey and see how it changes the whiskey profile. Or take a sip of the whiskey before you have the beer, then take a sip of the beer and then try the whiskey again. And, and what that beer is doing is actually 
adding, changing your, your palate on your tongue and, 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 and sort of you'll, 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 if you've ever done it, you'll, you'll notice the differences and a lot of unique flavors that are kind of hidden uh, will kind of get um, uh, spotlighted, I guess is the right word, to the, to the surface um, by, because of the, the way they work with the, the beer and the pe- flavor palate. Um, John, who's one of our sort of guests, he's actually got a YouTube channel and he talks about Boilermakers quite a lot. So if you're interested in learning more, um, just follow John. He's on Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera. So um, John, John knows all about Boilermakers and he's going through a lot of different, um, you know, matches and, and what works, what doesn't work. So um, yeah, shout out to John there as well. But um, I, I really like this. This, this whiskey um, is going down so easily, even at um, 52%. Um, is there a reason why you bottled it so high? Is this um, well? The, the reason is that's what we felt it worked best. What we do when we're looking at a bottling strength is we'll do 46, 48, 50, 52, and we'll actually try it at different strengths. We felt that the 48, 46 or 48 was too soft. It needed it needed a bit more punch. Over 52, the punch was too great. So by bottling it at 52, we got flavour, but we also got a good support in the in, in the alcohol. So it was, it was something that we tried here in the distillery, and we, that's what we felt was best for that particular style. No, I definitely <laughs> definitely agree. And then uh, John makes a comment: it doesn't drink like a 50 plus percent; it more like a 46 percent on the palate. So it's mm. it's very easy drinking for for such a high ABV whiskey, but. Uh, Another question from the audience, uh, Hugh asks, uh, what do you do to make sure your tasting is consistent? Um, I assume you're talking about the, the, the final product, right? In terms of how the taste is, is consistent amongst uh, batches, if, if I'm hearing, understanding you correctly, Hugh. Uh, well, we basically sit down as a, as a little group and we blind taste. Um, and we will write notes on the nose and we'll write notes on the palate that we're experiencing. And um, if we are um, all in agreement or agreement, I'm not quite sure what the English word is there, um, that it is hitting the spot and it is ready to go, then at that point we will agree to bottle that. Um, if we're talking about one of our core range whiskies, like the classic or the peated, the first two whiskies you've had, we'll likely sit down with. Um, barrel samples and also a already bottled peated um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of marker so we know what we're, what we're tasting just to make sure because you know life goes on and you sometimes sometimes it's been a little while before you know and you haven't tried the peated so you got to make sure you know what you what you're tasting is what you want to be putting into a bottle but um yeah we're, we're very uh, strict that uh, if it's not ready we will just put it back for another six months and uh, we'll try it again then. So we've got a little birth certificate against every barrel. So we, we write notes and we, we see how it's progressing along the way. And, and, and just to jump in, you guys, these are all single casks bottlings or, or vattings? No, all single cask bottlings, everyone. So just to clarify for those at home, um, there's a few different ways. Um, the big distilleries, they, they, you know, the ones that do blends or your Glenfiddichs, uh, they will take that barrel of whiskey and they will pour it usually into a giant container of that and, and they will maybe use 50% of it, they will bottle it and then they'll take the next lot of barrels and they'll fill it in and then every single batch is as consistent because you have a little bit from the previous one and the previous one and it kind of, they keep the flavour as consistent as possible, always topping it up if that makes sense uh, to their specs. Um, you've got other systems like Solera, I think Star would use that as well where you will have Basically, uh, you take a bit of whiskey from a top barrel, uh, you, you kind of pour it into a barrel below it and then into a bar- barrel below it as well. And it's kind of like a top to bottom system. And then the ones that you take out and bottle is from the bottom barrel, uh, or you can kind of combine all these barrels together. So, so Lark uh, does vattings where they'll get 60 barrels of similar specs. They'll put it into a giant container. They'll, they'll let it all mix in together and it's, they'll call it a batching. Yeah. Uh, but when we're talking a single cask, uh, it's basically whatever comes out of that barrel is then bottled and, and that's it. You will never repeat the flavours that are from that barrel, if I understand correctly. Very, very quickly, absolutely. The first most important thing is the processing, the, the stages we go through. We know what steps in from, from the, the very beginning of making whiskey to the very end, what steps we must be crucial that, that we uh, never change, number one. 
But number two, when I started, a mixture of three, three uh, casks mixed together will give an average. And an average is never as good as the best. So for that reason, we don't mix casks because you just get an average over, over it. Um, we, the way that we get consistency basically is to taste casks at regular periods over time. Some casks, as Andrew said, take five years, some take six, some take six and a half. They're all different. And by, by tasting the casks on a regular basis, we can pick up when they reach the point that we're really happy with. So that's how we get consistency. Well, that's really good to hear. And another question from Hugh in the audience, how much variation do you have in each of the barrel flavors? And, and second part is, are there some that you haven't liked that you've actually said well, not to bottle? Last question first, no. We've never had um, a cask that we've rejected, ever. Um, how, how do, with consistency, the consistency is accounted for by leaving it longer in the barrel. That will, that will take up the slack. Okay, and in terms of the variation, you've, um, you just obviously have your specs there, so you, you, and you're tasting quite frequently, I imagine, to, to have that balance, right? Yes, 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 absolutely. And in terms of barrel size, uh, Ulex asks um, relatively small barrels. What, what um, I know Australians use all kinds from 20 litres up to 500 litres, but uh, what, what kind of barrels uh, should we, uh, what you guys use? When I started, because I want, well, before, I, before we start on that, the smaller the barrel, the more quickly the whiskey will mature. It has a greater surface area to volume ratio. Um, when I started, I wanted results very quickly. Is, am I wasting all my money or is this going to have a future? So the barrels that I used initially were 50 litre. I had two 25 litre hogsheads reduced down in size to 50 litres. And we used those for the first three or four years. We got whiskey after three or four years that was, that was okay. The problem with it is that the small barrel has huge losses. In Scotland, the, the losses, the alcohol losses is typically 2%. Here, for the 50 litre barrel, you're looking at 10%. So after five years, half the barrel's gone. And, so and that's, uh, that's angel share that you're referring yeah, to, right? True. Exactly, that's the angel share. So economically, 50 litre barrels, are you can get whiskey quickly, but you're losing so much. So I then said, okay, from now on, we'll use 100 litre only. And then now we only use 225 litre hogsheads. We don't reduce them in size. And the losses we're getting are about, uh, about 3 to 4%, okay. which, which is okay. That's, I think that's pretty decent. I know... Um... Blackgate Distillery in um, Western New South Wales, they, they have minus 10 sometimes in winter, 45 degrees summer. They, they, their losses are, are tragic. Um, mm. You know, almost half the barrel gone after three years just in evaporation. So, um, yeah, it sounds thirsty. like you guys. It depends thirsty on angels here in Australia. Very, very thirsty. A few more questions coming in. Um, thanks. Uh, I should clarify. So Lisa, who's uh, drinking with Ulex, is asking all the questions. So thanks, Lisa, for, for that one. Uh, but Mick asks, um, how many barrels would you be uh, tasting a week? Oh, on, <laughs> this, is the, this is the job that everybody wants, isn't it? Uh, nobody asks questions about the cleaning and sanitizing that we do. <laughs> uh, uh, look, it, it, it depends. Look, really, really, we, we don't keep a huge amount of stock in bottles on site. So basically, once we're getting low in a certain style, like the classic or the peated, we'll go, okay, we've got to do another bottling shortly. Um, let's go and try um, six or seven barrels, which we think are probably getting close to being ready to go. Um, and that's when we'll try those six or seven and we'll compare notes and see which one's ready to go. So that might happen... That might happen once a fortnight. So, um, so we sort of we sort of taste when we need to when we need to do a bottling. Um, we will periodically perhaps go through and take out little samples of every single barrel just to sort of have a bit of a check on how things are going. That might be once every six months or twelve months. Um, so, um, yeah, not all the time, but um, it, it, that that is a pleasurable part of the job. That's for sure. 
Okay. Now, I quickly saw a, a comment saying, uh, have, what repairs do we have on our steel? How much copper work has been done? Um, well, the answer is to, to this day, zero. Um, the steel that we purchased 20 years ago is exactly the same as it is today. So we've been very, very lucky. I think the best reason for that is that the manufacturer that, that made it um, used very thick copper. So there's plenty of copper there um, to, to slowly dissolve away. So no, we've n never ever had any problems with the still. No, it's, it's a really good point. Oh, we've got some photos and stuff. Uh, I'll put up the presentation in a couple of minutes, but uh, I think it's time for whiskey number four, uh, a, a good time to kind of uh, crack into it. So that's the Bakery Hill Doublewood CS, which stands for cast strength on your, on your little sample bottles. So pour yourself a, a little bit of um, the, the cast strength of double wood. Um, th this, I've actually got a bottle. This is one of my favorite Aussie whiskeys of all time. Um, it's, Incredibly consistent. You can water it down if you want a little bit uh, weak. Enjoy cast strength whiskey. You can drink it straight. It's. Um, I'll let the guys talk about the flavour notes, but this it's not even available, Ollie. It's. Uh, oh, oh so there's a bit of Belgian. Oh, you got the Belgian barley there, John. You got the that's the whiskey the whiskey club one, right? Well, this yeah. is different. Now that, um, that's all we have in the distillery. There you go. But yeah. this, this is a this is a new one, right? This is, this is going to be a new one at some point. Um, in fact, we keep getting asked about doing, releasing the double wood at cask strength, and it's something that um, we've just actually not got around to because you're just too busy doing what you do. Um, so our double wood traditionally is released at 46%, alongside the same as the classic and the peated, which you guys had whiskeys one and two. Um, but um, yeah, due to popular demand, um, we're looking at releasing the releasing cask strength. So you're talking about 60% um, double wood. So drawn straight from that cask. Um, so probably next year, um, I would say there's a few other things um, coming in beforehand. There's the double wood, the uh, the traditional double wood. Thanks for showing that one, guys. Not much left. Angel shares pretty big at your house there. Um, so the double wood. Um, we'll just talk about briefly again this is an un unpeated whiskey starts its life as the classic uh, in american oak ex-bourbon barrels for six seven years we then finish it for the last 10 or 11 or 12 months in a french oak barrel um so the french dad, dad you might want to talk about what the what the impact of the french oak's going on but that's really um the, the, the difference there is that last 10 or 11 or 12 months in a French oak barrel. Basically, um, if you want to get a whiskey very, very quickly, the best way of doing it is to put your, put your spirit into uh, French oak because French oak, whether it's wine casks, sherry, port or Madeira casks, is not heavily charred. Now, with the heavy charring, that creates a barrier and it stops the alcohol, the spirit, working into the wood to any extent. So the classic whiskey that you had for number one, that's been matured in American oak bourbon casks. You've got very, very little wood character in that because of the heavy charring. What you get with French oak is a light, uh, very, uh, the, the wood has been strip, stripped back to bare wood and it's been given a, a, a very light tan, very, very light. It's not charred at all. Now, what that means is the spirit is in contact with the wood, can soak into the wood, and can pick up the wood characteristics. Now, when you nose the whiskey you've got in your glass now, you'll notice that it has cedar wood on the nose. That's coming from the French oak. What, what it basically does is gives wood character. It changes the whole flavor profile from the classic to something which is like plum pudding, raisins, sultanas, cedar wood. The wood character is, is coming through. Now, Andrew mentioned we leave it in the French oak cask for uh, six, uh, six, seven, eight months max, because no two casks are alike and, it, and some are more active than others. So it's another job we do is when we're doing the French is to put the classic in and then taste it every couple of months just to see how it's going. Because what we don't, would, what we don't want is the whiskey to be over wooded, and that's all you all you're getting. Now with this, you're getting wood 
but it's balanced with all the other flavour components. With with this one, guys, at 60%, um, you could also start experimenting with a couple of drops of water as well. Um, so it's a, just a little bit of a, um, with, with some of our other cask strength whiskey, whiskies, just maybe one or two drops of water can tend to round out the flavour if you're feeling a little bit, a little bit intensely. Um, but I wouldn't do too much more than just a couple of drops. It just would it just round it out. No, I like it like that. It's or my, straight, or absolutely my, straight. It's my personal view. <laughs> but really? we're all different, and that's the wonderful thing about whiskey. Uh, we this this is stuff. a gorgeous drop, guys. Thank you for that. Lisa uh, from is commenting. This one's fantastic. So I definitely agree. This is um, the peated was great. I like that sweetness. The blunderbuss, yeah. The 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 stout finish. Um. I think adds a, a complexity, but this this is a whole different level. I'm 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 falling in love with this, guys. Thank you. <laughs> we we you think we should make put it out as a, a commercial uh, commercial product? Ah, uh, yeah, it's um ready to go. Please um fast track <laughs> it as much as you can. <laughs> right, hands up for a bottle. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few there. <laughs> It, it, it's a bit, it, it is a bit funny. I mean, the double wood has just been so popular for us. Um, it's one of those things where it's obvious that the classic, that the cask strength version would be amazing as well. But it's just one of those things where you just, you're too busy making the stuff and, you know, peddling your other whiskies and all of a sudden, you know, you, you lose another year and it's, um, but um, yeah, absolutely. This is on the cards to cards to come out. So what I might do, because I'm just conscious uh, we've got about 10 minutes left of the tasting, I'll um, chuck up the, uh, the, the couple of pictures we have in the presentation and we can chat about the, uh, the new distillery as well that's coming uh, very soon as well. So mm -hmm. let me um, just uh, share screen. The suspense is killing me, mate. <laughs> what, Sorry, I'm what's a, this I'm new a, distillery? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a couple of whiskeys in, okay? So just... <laughs> How many tastings have you done today? Uh, this is my first one. Um, <laughs> can everyone see that? Hopefully. Is the presentation working? Yep. Awesome. So a couple, couple pictures at the beginning. Um, this is basically the team here in their current distillery. You can see the, the wash uh, tanks there. Um, that's where they brew the, brew the beer basically before they, they distill it. You've got the, the cute little uh, thousand litre, I believe, uh, still in the back there. That's Steve. That's Steve. Um, we'll, we'll jump forward because I think the more interesting uh, pictures come up. But uh, there's, there's a better shot of uh, Steve. And look at that copper colour. That's, um, that's gorgeous. Uh, I, I love um, still, still imagery. Is, um, every single still has got a unique shape. Um, you want to maybe talk about why you, know, what, why you chose that particular design while we've got that picture can, up? Yes, I can do that. Um, while, while the image is in front of everyone, we'll talk about that very image. Um, the first thing about stills is, do you want your whiskey to be aromatic or not? Now, if you want your whiskies to be aromatic and have a beautiful nose, light, frisky, you need to have a tall still. The taller the still, the more aromatic the whiskey will be. Now, I wanted an aromatic whiskey, so what you're looking at in our still is just is around about four metres tall. Now, the reason for it is that the, the molecules, the particles that make up the whiskey come in different sizes. The aromatic ones are very small. The, the large ones, the oils, the waxes are large. So when you heat them up, they all move up in, in the still at a, at, to different heights. The aromatic ones, because they're small, will go up a lot further. The large ones will get to a point and drop back. So that's why a tall still will give you aromatic whiskies. And that's what we wanted. Now, the second thing that you'll see on the still, it's got a bulge on, the, on it. That's called a boiling bulge or a reflux bulge. Now, if you want body in your whiskey, you have to have a reflux bulge. That per, what it does is the particles, as, the, as they evaporate, as they boil and they move up the, the column, they reach the reflux bulge and because it's expanded out as a ball, it's, it's a lot cooler than the surrounding area. So the, so the vapours condense and drop back. So what it's doing is it's condensing and, and concentrating everything in the pot of the still. So that when that comes across, it comes across 
um, and to give you uh, a three-dimensional structure. So stills without a boiling bulge won't give you a, uh, a, a rich, full whiskey. Yeah. Um, the other thing which I've got no idea is the line arm. The line arm is the area at the top, which is in ours is called a descending line arm. They can either be descending where they're coming down, horizontal or ascending going up. Now the design of this, the line arm, basically what it does is because it's descending, oil, um, vapors come across, they turn into a liquid and they flow into the condenser. If it was pointed up, they'd flow back into the still. Now what effect that has on the flavor profile of our whiskey, I've got no idea at all but I know we've got what's called a descending line arm. The last thing is the condenser, and that's on the right-hand side. Now, condensers can be two styles. Uh, firstly, it can be a tube in shell, and that's like a round tube, a round, piece, a round tube going through water to cool it. What we've got here, basically, um, is lots and lots of very, very thin tubes about uh, two millimetres in diameter, moving down from the top of that um, condenser down to the bottom. What we want with our whisky is to have a clean flavour. Now, believe it or not, the Scots back 100 years ago, they built their stills out of, out of copper because it was convenient, it was easy to use. They didn't realise that copper is the only material that stills should be made of because there's a lot of sulfur compounds in the vapours and they react with the copper and form copper sulphide and basically it removes the sulphur stink from the whiskey. Now, the condenser, because it's lots of thin tubes, actually uh, what it does is it purifies the liquid as it's going down the condenser. Whew. There you go. It's another hour and we can keep going. But, <laughs> Mate, so, you know, that, I think um, that's it. Basically, what I'm saying is that every dimension, everything in that still is affecting what we get out. And it's beyond me, I don't know. Mate, that, that is, um, it's always interesting learning about um, still design and, and, and everything's done by, by conscious effort. Um, the Scots yeah. obviously don't waste anything uh, and a little bit tight on, 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 a, on a lot of things as a running joke. So for them to, to invest so much copper material for a specific reason makes perfect sense, uh, but it's great to actually un understand some of the dynamics that, that go in. But um, let's let's crack into whiskey number five, the very last one, Bakery Hill Peated Musket Barrel Finish. Um, so whilst uh, everyone's pouring it, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going with the photos so of the gallery. So uh, you guys have just updated your label design. So there's a, a brand new picture of um, what to look at on the bottle shop. There may be some bottles out there that have some of the old design out there, but uh, these are these are the new ones, I believe, right? What's that bottle yeah. on the right? Do we still have some of that? Yeah, here? that well, that's the Sovereign Smoke. So um, that's gone, been and gone, a past classic. But um, yeah, really, what we just done with there, it's a very very light modification of the labels, and this was probably a couple of years ago now, um, which is just um, changing the colour of the words so that the the classic range has got classic um, written in red, or it's got the across the the the, the um, front of the uh, label. The double wood has double double wood written in blue and the peated range is written in green. So it just keeps it a bit easier for bartenders out there working in low light. And um, as we're talking in the future, so um, maybe maybe um, David or Andrew, if you want to jump in and actually tell us about the whiskey first, the musket, and, and then we can talk about what these uh, sketches are. This is just down the road from you, Andrew, so you better talk about it. Well, well, I will talk about this, but why don't you introduce the musket finish firstly? Ah, all right, why not? Well, and then we can talk about the, the future. Yeah. Look, the musket finish, um, as Ollie knows, there's lots of good friendships built up in, in the hospo industry. Uh, there's a lot of very, very nice people. And uh, I was doing a tasting of all places up north of Melbourne in the, the Hillsville Hotel. And it was getting a bit late and I thought, mm, I think I might have a meal here while I'm, you know, save me mucking around. So I ordered a meal and I spoke to the guy that served me and I said, what's a really, really nice wine to go with this? And he said, well, we've got this wine, which we don't normally have. It comes from a winery called Pimpernel. 
and they specialise in producing wines which are French origin. So I said, yeah, what the hell, I'll give that a go. And it was a Pinot Noir. It's the best wine I've ever had anywhere. Fantastic. And Andrew heard me saying, he said, oh, here, Dad's doing his normal thing. So he went up there and ended up buying two dozen or something. But we've actually uh, formed a relationship with the Pimpernel Winery because we're all in the same industry. We all enjoy the same things. We've got the same enjoyments. And I was talking to the winemaker up there and he said, oh, by the way, we do a musket. Uh, we've got a couple of musket barrels down here that um, we're finished with. You might be interested in them. And I thought, what the hell? We'll give it a go. I've got no idea what we're going to do with them, but we'll give it a, we'll give it a go. So what we did, now this is our Peter, wasn't it, Andrew? Yeah. Yep. yeah. So what we did is we, we got the musket barrels straight out of the Pimpernel Winery and we put some of our peated malt in there, left it in there for, for a, a, quite a few months. Now, what you've got in there is the um, cars, what is it? The, 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 I'm losing my brain, the musket finish. So this is musket finish from the Pimpernel Winery using one of their barrels to mature our whiskies. The Peter. Yeah. This is a really good whiskey to finish with. Um, it's really like an after after dinner whiskey, really. I mean, you get that sweetness from the musket straight away. Um, we did experiment. We actually grabbed some of the musket um, and we put a few drops of it into each of our whiskies, the classic and the double wood and the peated, just to see which one it worked the best with. And it really, really worked the best with the peated because it, the musket being sweet, there was too much sweetness going on, adding it to the, the double wood and the classic. And that's the savouriness and the smokiness and the earthiness of the peated whiskey balanced that sweetness of the musket so well. Um, so we've, we, this, is, this is a cask sample. This, we've brought this down to 50% basically for you guys. So it could be more, it could be you know, less. I'd be interested if you guys had an opinion on whether it needs a bit more guts with alcohol or whether it's about right. Um, but um, again, this one's probably gonna be a next year, a next year release. So it's gonna be exciting. We're the, uh, the very first in the world to actually try this work yes. in progress, right? Absolutely. Yep. No one else has ever tried it. We, and and we can, it's, it's officially whiskey already, right? Oh, yeah. Well, this is about the, the, peated, the peated whiskey I'm talking about was probably, I think it was around four years old um, before going in. So, and it was been in the musket for about 12 months. So, um, absolutely, absolutely a whiskey. We'll, um, we'll, we'll do a quick poll at the very end of the tasting to see what everyone's thoughts are. But um, <laughs> let, let's just uh, jump into these sketches, yeah. um, Andrew. What, what's well, um, happening here? Exciting times ahead. So um, if, if anyone in the room has been to our current distillery yet in uh, Bayswater, which is about uh, 45 minutes east Andrew, of... Andrew, Andrew, on the sunny slopes of Mount Dandenong. Thank you. All the sunny slopes of Mount Dandenong. Um, the base of Mount, it's an industrial lot. We're in an industrial area. Um, the distillery itself is not particularly easy on the eye. Most distilleries are pretty industrial really, um, but it served its purpose for 20 years. Um, so we've been looking for the last two or three years to relocate to a bigger distillery so we can A, produce more whiskey because we're running out of space. We're jamming barrels everywhere at the moment. And we can get a bigger um, scale. But more importantly is we really want to create more of a whiskey experience, more of a cellar door, more of a, uh, a retail and an event space where people can come in, do tastings, do the tours, stay on for a bit longer and have a, a whiskey paddle. Um, they sort of really showcase the whiskies the way that they, they should be showcased. Um, so we've identified a location in Kensington, which is in a very inner northern suburb of Melbourne. It's only two train stops from Southern Cross Station. Uh, it's a nice, beautiful old building um, and close to public transport, other cafes, restaurants, these sort of things. And we are working through the, the planning and the architecture and these sort of things as we speak. Um, at this stage, it's looking like a June, July next year relocation but a lot of work to do in the meantime. What you're looking at there is just some graphical sketches of the vibe, I guess, that we're looking to, looking to create. Um, you can see on the top right-hand corner there, that's a bit of a sort of a, a whiskey bar with some um, uh, bench seats looking 
through the back to where the distillery is, um, stills, barrel racks. We can open up that space to have more events in there. Um, an exciting little feature on the top left image is Dad's little uh, little car, his little Citroen 2CV for any uh, uh, classic car nuts out there that, that we can have that sort of branded up and we can take that around for events. Um, so um, yeah, it's gonna be exciting times ahead. We're gonna be able to uh, have a new home and we'll, we'll be able to grow into that um, and, and, you know, and stay there hopefully for the next 10, 20 years. Oh, there, there it is, there it is, Andrew. That's the inside, yep. Well, yes. So work in progress, whiskey, work in progress, new distillery, guys. Yep, so hopefully toward the end of 2021, um, we will be open for, for visitors. Um, so I urge everybody, if you're not already joined up to our email list and following us on Facebook, and Instagram, do do that so you keep in touch with all, the, all of our details and, and how we're progressing and the exciting um, exciting times and exciting new releases that we're going to have coming through over the next 12 to 18 months as well. What's, um, what's everyone think of this, uh, the last whiskey, this uh, peated musket? What's everyone's um, opinions? Give us a thumbs up if, uh, if, you, if you enjoy this one. A lot of thumbs up in the room. That's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Hugh, for uh, when I was in presenter mode, I didn't see the uh, the chat room was uh, waiting to, to let you back in. So apologies, uh, but we've uh, got you back in, in hopefully. Um, that kind of concludes tonight. Uh, five amazing whiskeys, uh, four kind of um, past and, and present, uh, one sort of future taste in progress. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to quickly go around the room, uh, maybe chuck it into the comments. Um, if you could pick one whiskey uh, that was your favourite tonight, um, please let us know. Uh, drop it into the comments. Um, yeah, let us know what you think about each of those whiskeys. Thank you again for joining us tonight. If there's any other sort of last minute questions, um, please please drop it in. I think we can we can stay on maybe for one or two more minutes. Um, Marco, actually, how you going, mate? Uh, has actually just said Nix uh, has uh, some of the sovereign smoke left. Uh, so. One bottle less, apparently. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> flying off the shelves very quickly. So um, I can see Jeremy's uh, got a, a couple in his collection there. Oh, as well. I, 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 I was waiting for Jeremy to start showing off with his back releases. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, waiting, he's waiting to drive up the price on that wisp of smoke for me to buy back off him. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let me, I'm just going through the chat really quickly. Uh, Mick actually asks, are you malting your own barley? Um, it's a really important question, I think. Are we? Yeah, are you guys malting no, your no, own barley? No, we're not. Um, I thought about it earlier in the piece. Um, there are lots of, uh, what we do is we use a, a maltings up in near Orange, New South Wales. It's Voyager. Now, I, I tried a lot of the, the Australian grains and the, the um, malted barley we get out of Voyager is really great so basically all the unpeated um, grain comes from voyager up in new south up near orange and where does your peated malt come from now there's a problem um, we wanted to get our peated malt malted in australia but the problem is burning peat um, is a contaminant and any of the multi maltsters today won't do it because the amount of peated malt that we would require annually is not worth it. So we actually have to get uh, our peated malt through uh, Scotland. We get it, yes, oh, through, through one of the, the maltings over there. I, I think a few Aussie distilleries um, do that as well and it's perfectly fine, as long uh, as the whiskey is made here. Oh, that, well, we're, we're talking to Voyager up in New South about doing a peated malt, uh, but that'll be down the track. Are you um, playing with any unique barley strands? I know the, they, they've got, um, like Archie Rose in Sydney, for example, use malt, uh, Voyager malt for some of their choc malt. Yes. Uh, Answering your question, no. Um, what I've found, we've used quite a number of different malts. Apart from yields, we've noticed no difference whatsoever with the quality or the style of whiskey that we're producing because the malted barley that we get is really just a source of sugars. And those sugars are then fermented into alcohol and flavor components. So I really don't think the malt that we buy from maltings is going to make any, any difference, apart from the yield we get 
El Cajonito. The, the, the exception to that was the, um, the Belgian double wood that we put together for the, the whiskey club earlier this year. Um, that's a Belgian, and that was the Sovereign Smoke as well. So that, that's from a Belgian Pilsen style grain, um, which is a little different and not often used in whiskey. So that's more of a brewing malt that did produce some different flavor profiles. So that, that's probably the exception there. I'm just going through the, the, the comments here. Um, Ulex says musket was fabulous. Uh, Jeff says peated malt was the best. Uh, Rebecca says uh, peated musket was my favorite. Uh, Lisa loved the, the cast strength wooded. Um, John uh, says musket cask was stunning. Big, <laughs> big, uh, big reviews from you, John. Um, <laughs> Ethan, Ethan says double wood car strength was hectic. Wow, that's uh, and um, yeah, some some of the others I uh, preferred the the blunderbuss. Uh, James, David, Anthony, Hef, Mick, and uh, I think there's the, that's the group in the room there. There's a there's a few of you doing the, the tasting together. They're getting their money's worth. They're yeah, they're definitely getting their <laughs> money's worth. They are the blunderbuss <laughs> from from there. It's a good it's a good spread. Um, the one thing that I will um, I don't know if anyone um has kept any classic back in their um, little sampler from the very first one. If now I probably should have mentioned this at the very start because that one over time absolutely turned super sweet and just stunning. So um, if you've got any more of the classic left, I would urge you to try a little bit more after this and um, the, the complexity just ramps up on that one. Very, very last question from the audience. So John asks, uh, what yeast do you use? I'm not going to tell you. Excuse me. <laughs> That is a secret. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we get our fr we get our use from France, but apart from that, no. Yeah, um, and we don't. I, I went through forty five different yeasts to start with. The yeast that we use is crucial to the product that we're getting out, and it as I said, it took me forty five different yeasts to get one that would work, and that's something we uh, we hold near and dear to our heart here. Um, but I'm just seeing your question there too, John. It is the same that we use the same yeast for all of our whiskies. Um, so we don't chop and change. We don't, and we also don't cultivate our own strand or anything like that. We don't have lab conditions to be able to uh, um, care for our yeast strands. We leave that to the yeast professionals. So we just call them up and they send the yeast to us. Awesome. Well, if there's no more other questions, um, thank you both gentlemen. i um, super looking forward to the new distillery. And once this whole COVID lockdown thing is over and dusted, um, please stay safe in the meantime for all Victorians on the call. Um, and yeah, we can't wait to pop down and visit the new distillery once it's up and running and, and get into that tasting room and, and even uh, jump into um, David's little car there as well, all yep. branded up. That, that'll be a, a lot of fun, so can't wait. Um, one more question from Hugh. Are you using a mix of malted and unmalted barley? Sorry, no. Hugh, for the, the no. question. I missed it before. No, no, not at all. No, we just use malted barley. That's it. All good. But, uh, yes, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And, um, yeah, as always, um, uh, thanks for supporting the Whiskey List and us uh, with these virtual tastings. We love supporting Aussie distilleries. and. And yeah, Bakery Hills, um, you know, being good friends with us for a long time. We, we've um, always try and catch up whenever we're down there in Melbourne or when they're up in Sydney presenting as well at the local fairs and stuff here. So hopefully we'll, we'll see you guys in person at the next one. But in, in the meantime, um, stay safe, everyone, and enjoy Bakery Hill. Uh, we'll drop an email in the next day or so with um, some links to purchase some whiskey, if some of the bottles that are available. Um, yeah, it's, so it's all selling out very quickly as well. But um, thanks again, gentlemen, for your time tonight. I'm uh, wish you everyone Look, Ollie, I'd just like very quickly to just to also just put a thank you so much for inviting us to display the whiskies that we produce. And I'd like to just remind people, buy Australian. We, the, the, the products that are being made within Australia now are equal to none. And we need to look at Australian producers, Australian outlets and support them because they, we all do it tough. and we'll get there in the end. Holly, thank you so much for inviting us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you guys. This is genuinely the best part of our job. We love uh, chatting to you guys and meeting people along the way. So, and Ollie, thanks for your support. Thanks for everyone's support who's joined us and hopefully we'll see you guys again in person or online. Cheers everyone. Thank see you guys. So Have a good night. Thanks, Cheers. Cheers. See ya.